I was called the voice in the wilderness. I was called a crackpot. But for the last 30 years, I've been making pr predictions about the automobile industry, and the highest percentage of my stuff has come true. Not because I'm so smart, but because other people are so stupid. You know, it had nothing to do with intelligence. It has more to do with common sense. But one thing I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of people in the car business that are spreading things disguised as research that are actually hidden agendas. Right now, there is a conspiracy I call the dealer apocalypse. There are vendors looking to put dealers out of business. They want to turn you into a warehouse. They want to... And, and the one thing they do is they always seem to produce some research that says this is consumer driven and the buzzword is it's all about the customer experience. Uh, which I looked it up in the dictionary and it translated to bull. <laughs> you know, so understand, there's a lot of people out there trying to steer you to do certain things. Things that make no sense and the vendors have successfully. The, the internet is the worst thing that ever happened to the car business. Think about that. I mean, it had to happen, and it's a wonderful thing, and I'm very, I'm very technologically adept. I teach internet courses, but the internet has never created a single additional customer that wouldn't have bought a car anyway. All they did was insert a bunch of vendors between us and the consumers and deprofitized us. These people were on Google stealing our customers and renting them back to us. Everybody got that, that concept? A couple years ago, Scott Painter at TrueCar announced he was going to absolutely decimate and destroy the car business. Everybody recalls the, the True Car debacle about four years ago. Well, the Federal Trade Commission said that I organized a boycott. The Federal Trade Commission investigated me. It, it cost me well over $50,000 to get out of that. And Scott Painter True Car says, Ziegler, you cost me $78 million. Because allegedly, I organized the dealers and I organized the, the industry and we, we brought True Car to their knees. But that concept of creating dealerships to become warehouses for the vendors to become the dealers, that is still ongoing. And there are a lot of people out there plotting and planning what I call the dealer apocalypse, to put you out of business and supplant you with something else. Now, now Tesla is not a real threat. I mean, a lot of people are saying, Ziegler, Tesla's a threat. He's going to tear down the franchise protections. I don't care. If you recall, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, General Motors and Ford, both with separate initiatives, tried to run dealerships in competition with the dealers. The manufacturer does not know how to sell cars. And what is amazing is every generation of manufacturer executives that comes in tries the same old stupid the previous generation of manufacturer executives did. They, did. they didn't learn anything from it. And the new ones come in and repeat the same mistakes. So understand, right now there is a lot of change and a lot of things happening in the car dealership, a lot of trends. But the trends they're predicting are not going to happen entirely. There's going to be change, there's going to be paradigm shift, but not what you're being told. A lot of things being presented at research are designed to cause you to do certain things and act a certain way. You know, you're being told that the consumers are doing this and the consumers are doing that. And one trend I'm seeing right now is they want to get the sale of the automobile under 45 minutes. Is anybody here successfully selling cars from handshake to taillights in less than 45 minutes? Matter of fact, if you tried to get a sale under 45 minutes, I think you would create bad customer satisfaction, legal problems, and first of all, it can't be done. You see, a lot of things that people outside the industry attribute to the car business are actually consumer driven. The consumers are causing the bottlenecks. I mean, 
Is a 45-minute sale possible? I think so, under certain conditions. I got a customer with an 800 credit score and cash in hand. I might get them in and out in less than 45 minutes. But then I got that credit challenge customer with a 600 credit score that wants a $200 payment. They're not getting out of here in 45 minutes. You know, it's all situational. But the point now is the vendors want to totally automate the sale of the car. And there's one, one thing that stops the automation of the sale of the car, and that's the F&I department. So there's a movement on right now to destroy the F&I department. I mean, they're, they're saying right now that the salespeople are going to deliver the cars, the salespeople are going to present the contracts, the customers are going to fill out the forms online. How many of you honestly believe that, I mean, they got statistics to back it up. They got some dealer in Wisconsin that's going to tell you 80% 80, 80 of our customers are filling out credit apps online. I got to call bull on that. I do. How many of your customers do you realistically believe are going to fill out a credit app online? Social security number, the entire thing. Not going to happen. But they're trying to automate the process so they can put it online. Cars.com recently has even gotten into the repair and service business. They're online right now advertising your service department up against Joe's gas station and trying to say it's comparable service and, and controlling the price. Not going to happen. The biggest buzz in the car business today is autonomous cars, cars that drive themselves they can just stop them from killing people. <laughs> you know, I've got a brand new 2016 Ford Explorer Limited. I mean, I'm done. I, since I've had my surgeries, I'm done with the Corvettes and I'm done with the Escalades. I'm back in a Ford. This thing does everything in the world. I got radar. I've got all sorts of technology. It even buzzed the other day and said, you're getting drowsy. I looked at that and said, son of a bitch. You know, it, it did. It said, and I was. <laughs> but the car told me. But one thing I have said repeatedly, there is no mandate for self-actuated, self-automated self uh, driving. The public is not clamoring for this. There's no mandate. There, matter of fact, 59% of consumers in three or four different surveys have said they wouldn't drive a self-driving car. So, once again, the, the, people are afraid of them. Right now, Delphi is in Singapore. Now, this where really gets scary. They're, they're testing. Anybody ever been to Singapore? Those people are friggin' maniacs on the road. I mean, they... You think traffic here is bad, you all see those people drive. They got bicycles and motorbikes and all things. No, they're not only testing self-driving cars, but they're actually going to put on the road Uber-type cars, ride-sharing, that the poor people in Singapore are going to make a phone call and the car just shows up <laughs> with nobody behind the steering wheel. Let's see how that works out for them. As you know, this past summer, a Tesla, self-driving, self the driver had hands off the wheel, at 70 miles an hour drove, in Florida, drove right through the back of a semi-truck, killed the driver. The sun got in its eyes. Tesla's, Elon Musk, Tesla, their, their explanation was, that the car didn't recognize the truck in the bright sun. <laughs> so now they're totally revamping their technology to work off of, of other things than, than visual. Well, folks, yeah, the, the Jetsons, we're not ready for that yet. I have been highly critical. There have been any number of accidents and injuries, now fatalities, with these private companies using our public highways for test tracks. Who, who gave these people permission to do this? I have no idea. Now, the manufacturers are 
investing heavily in rideshare. Ford Motor Company, General Motors, Lyft, and Uber, they're, they're putting a lot of money toward it, and they're banking on the fact that the millennials are going to go to, to ride-sharing as opposed to buying their vehicles. And once again, there's going to be a wholesale move. Recently, several of the import manufacturers have put up lease programs for Uber owners, for Uber drivers. Once again, bad vision. How many General Motors dealers do I have in the room? A couple. General Motors, how's that shop click and drive working out for you? <laughs> Ed? How's that new used car program working out for you? They sold 15 cars in the zone. These people have not seen the ball since the kickoff. You know, the Detroit Lions had a problem the other day. They they found a white powder on the on the on the on the um, football field. The police were called in. They analyzed it. It was a goal line. <laughs> That's the manufacturers. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. And this guy, Alan Beatty. I have never ever said that Alan Beatty was a blithering idiot. Now, don't ever say I said that because I didn't. The word nincompoop comes to mind. But then again, I could be wrong. But the General Motors initiatives, they are bad at it because what they did was they have, they have spiked leasing up where leasing is now close to 49% of transactions across the country. And they spiked leasing up by putting very high residuals on the cars which is great, but they've got to insure those residuals, and those cars come back, and now they've got to put them on the market. So last spring, General Motors was the first one. They, all those cars came back, and they took them to auction, and nobody picked them up. Nobody bought the cars. And then the fleet returns came back, and once again, they had residualized the cars too high with the fleet companies. So that's why they devised the shop, click, and drive, and the, and the used car program they're putting out right now. And that's why they only sold 15 cars in the zone, because those cars are never going to bring the money they're in them for. But now we've got Chrysler, Ford, and Toyota about to dump huge amounts of inventory in the market. It's going to absolutely explode the used car bubble. And they're going to want too much money for them. The dealers aren't going to go for it. It's going to create a, a, a real quandary. They, the rate of travel has really slowed down for the last quarter. The SAR is not where they thought it was going to be. So we're, we're not going to experience a recession like we did in 2008, but I'm saying we're going to have a slowdown. I've written this, and I've, I've generally been pretty right. I think Chrysler is in for a rocky road. And I'm, I'm waiting to see what, how Mar Marcioni, he's been very clever. He's, he's a genius at getting in and out of trouble. Let's see what happens with him. But the Jeep product right now is kind of interesting. Out of 53 cars in both surveys, uh, car, car and Driver and J.D. Power, is 52 out of 52 in quality, the Fiat product. Out of 52 cars on bo both reports, Fiat is number 52, the worst of cars retailed in the U.S. Uh, Fiat dealing room, I apologize, that's just the way it came out. But you know what's kind of interesting? 51 is the Jeep Grand Cherokee. <laughs> the 51st worst quality, initial quality car in the marketplace is one of the best selling cars in, in the market today. I have always said that sheet metal design sells cars more than quality. If you've got a good looking car, it will sell no matter how the initial quality is. And that has borne me out time and time again. It's true. And the Jeep is a, is a good, good example of that. But, but Ford, Ford's aluminum truck has been a big success. And I'm, I'm driving a Ford for the first time in 20 years. I, 
I have a new contract with Ford. And I had a contract with General Motors and drove Escalades and Corvettes throughout the early 2000s. Real, real satisfied with the product. Then we go to the other side of things, Toyota. Once again, Toyota's coming out with new models, new designs. They're, they're, they're innovating. They're moving to Texas. But what I'm seeing there, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I wrote that Scion was a bad idea. You know, everybody's chasing millennials. There's no such thing as millennials. You know, the general idea of a millennial is somebody that lives in mom's basement when they're 30 playing Xbox sitting on the couch. <laughs> you know. But the, but the truth of the matter is, I said it in print, I've said it in speeches, by the time millennials came of age, they became us. They're moving to the suburbs, they're having babies, and they're buying cars, and they're doing the same. They're, not, they're, they're just like my generation. We were hippies, they're millennials, I don't care what. But the point is, there's nothing different. That these people are in the market. And the millennials are one of the biggest excuses for the new innovations. You can't do this because the millennials won't go for it. The millennials won't do it. Yes, they will. You know, the processes that we have in the car business are driven by consumers. And, you know, the, the, the CFPB is right now prosecuting dealers. Like I said earlier, the biggest prosecution of dealers today is for power booking. You know, Sarah, Sarah Nissan in Birmingham, Alabama, the dealer and uh, I believe three managers, maybe four managers, went to prison for falsifying credit applications to Cap One. Falsifying STIP. A dealer just went went to prison and was fined heavily in New Jersey for creating false jobs and, and false documentation of jobs. Once again, one of the dealers that I work with, and I'm not going to name this dealer because they're one of my clients, and they just got 56 counts of falsifying credit applications, falsifying documents, falsifying... And it came out of their subprime department, and they're going to have to pay at least a million dollars because of one employee. The dealer I'm talking about is, has been doing business with me since 1989. One of the most reputable dealers I have ever known. Would not have stood for this or second had he known. But one employee has exposed him to millions of dollars of liability, you know, and, and probably that, I know that individual is going to jail. I don't know who else is going to end up caught up in this web. You know, right now it is absolutely imperative that your dealership, now I heard about, fraud, we talked about fraud today. What department in your dealership is most likely to engage in fraud? Pre-owned. Pre-owned. <laughs> what are you laughing about over there? <laughs> Is that Shifty's department? <laughs> yeah, pre-owned's your biggest liability. I'll tell you what, I, I, I have an office employee book every transaction behind the used car manager. Not that we don't trust you, but <laughs> we don't trust you. <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're, we're booking every transaction just to see if there's a red flag. Especially when a, when a car travels from dealer, dealer to wholesaler to dealer to wholesaler and never gets retailed. <laughs> that sort of sends one up. But in the industry today, the, the trends are, are coming in hot and heavy with the lead providers claiming that they're generating all the leads. The lead provider model is obsolete. None of these lead providers are producing what they say they provide. That is an absolute fact. So what I want to do right now, and as part of this, 
if you recall the last time I was here, open it up, ask me anything about anything that's happening in the industry. Oh, you would ask about that. Now, I'm not saying this guy is a, is a blithering idiot either. Uh, Mr. Denishian, did I say his name right? Johan Denishian? You know, South African guy with a British accent. Complete Looney Tunes. My, my opinion, Mr. Cameraman, did I say my opinion? Yes, I did. My opinion, he's a complete Looney Tunes. He came in and they're going to revamp Cadillac. Now, his whole strategy is throwing away all of their old consumers. We don't want those old people driving Cadillacs. And we haven't got replacement customers for them, but we're going to throw away our entire Cadillac customer base. We don't want these people. They're deplorables. So, <laughs> the Denishans, he came from Audi. And when he was at Audi, the first thing he did was move the national headquarters. He was at Infinity, he moved the national headquarters. It comes to Cadillac, he moves the national headquarters to New York. And then he says, we're going to go after BMW drivers. We're going to go after Mercedes. We're going to go after Audi people. We're going to, we're going to move up into the, the luxury segment. And then he looked at the product and he said, Cadillacs have goofy-ass names that the public doesn't recognize, CTS, I don't know, STS, letters, you know, alphanumerics. Excuse me, alphanumerics. Stop trying to be Europeans. American cars have names and cubic inches and shit. <laughs> right? <laughs> so this, this full Denetian renamed the models with other unrecognizable alphanumerics. Now nobody has any brand identity on Cadillac, which has been Cadillac's problem all along. Escalade, I know what an Escalade is, but an STS, I got no friggin' idea. I'm, and I'm in the business. Lincoln did the same thing. I mean, I, I have been so critical of Lincoln because I, I, I love Ford Motor Company. I, I cut my teeth. I got my first contracts with Ford. I drove Lincoln Town Cars. I knew what a Lincoln Town Car was. But now we got MKZ, MKZ MKT, MKX. I'll quit it. I'm, they have no brand identity. I guarantee you that very few consumers can tell you the models in the Lincoln or Cadillac lineups. They have no brand identity. You know, back when we had names and cubic inches, I mean, that's humor, but still and all, brands had recognizable. I'm a little older than most people in this room, but I can tell you, I remember when I was a teenager climbing over the fence to see the new models that came out. And the dealers had, had their showrooms all painted off, and you couldn't see the models. We don't have that excitement anymore. We got graduated introductions of the vehicles. Unbelievable. Then he's come up with this Project Pinnacle. Guess what we're going to do? We're going to get rid of small town dealers. Everybody wants to pick on small town dealers. And, but we're not going to take the Cadillac franchise away from them because you'd sue our ass if we took it away from you. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you no inventory and virtual reality headset test drives. Is that true or false? Cadillac wants to go to virtual reality headsets. They're going to put a headset on a consumer and they're going to make an $80,000 car purchase. <laughs> they're after that Xbox generation. <laughs> now, what's, what's the possibility that that's going to work? These people are absolutely clue impaired. So the Project Pinnacle... Yeah, every, every time the manufacturer comes out with an incentive program, one of, my Ford, one of my Ford dealers said, Jim, they told us it was a carrot on a stick. But I caught it one time, and it was a dog turd painted orange. <laughs> I mean, the incentive programs are, are absolutely wicked. Questions? 
Yes, sir. <laughs> well, as you know, Volkswagen is with the TDID, so that that was going to be their, their saving grace. But, but let's face it, Volkswagen deliberately engineered a fraud. I mean, that, I mean, this wasn't a mistake, it wasn't an accident. They deliberately built cars that defrauded people with the mileage and the emissions. So did Mercedes. That's coming out now. That, that investigation's happening as we speak. Have they compensated the dealers? No. They've lost billions. Because and the consumer suits are still coming. We don't know where this is going to end up, to answer your question. I don't know where it's going to end up because it's still an ongoing situation. As is Takata airbags. General Motors was really mad at me when I pointed it out a couple years ago when they had the ignition problems. I had a General Motors representative in one of the dealerships I was working with just beating the dealer to death about CSI. You're, you know, you, how many people have had that conversation? You're just beating the dealer over the head about, we want our customers to be satisfied. Well, yeah, well, at least the dealer didn't kill them. <laughs> you know, when you put ignition switches in cars that kill people, and you know in advance it's going to kill people, that's premeditated mur corporate murder. They factored the legal fees into the cost of building the cars. They actually put it in their cost expense, expense structure. When a manufacturer conspires to hide something they know is killing people and continues to do it, Takata airbags. They've known about Takata airbags for more than a decade, and, and they continue to build them. Matter of fact, there are manufacturers at this moment still installing defective Takata airbags that they know are defective because they can't get, get anything else. You've got people, manufacturers today building and delivering cars with airbags that they're, they hope to get new technology to replace the, the deadly airbags they're putting in right now. But they're still building them. How many, how many people have been compensated? This is, this is a big issue in the business right now. How many people are being compensated for stop sale? How many people have got units in stop sale behind the fence? If you're a Honda dealer, you certainly do. Almost every dealer in the world had Takata airbags. I mean, the majority of manufacturers were using one supplier. And I have seen right now Honda dealers that I know that have installed, that have disactivated the airbags in the cars and gotten a consumer to sign a statement that they knew their airbags were, dis were disactivated. Once again, Takata conspired to do a criminal thing. It's not like they made a mistake. It's not like they had an engineering accident. They premeditated and continued to sell these things. There's got to be some corporate responsibility for manufacturers that do that. So don't, don't chastise my dealership about CSI when you, when you premeditated kill your customers. You make sense? Questions? Where do you think uh, auto trade or car is going to be here to now? I mean, in our store, we're thinking about eliminating auto trade. Well, if you... Who, who are you asking? If you ask, if you ask autotrainercars.com, your dealership will go out of business without them. If you ask me, they're, they're both being sucked down in the tar pits, eating the last brown shriveled leaves off the trees. I don't think cars.com nor autotrader, it's my opinion now, I don't think either one of them have a viable business model in today's market. I don't think either one of them is viable. I don't think e either one of them is going to, without a severe overhaul now, Cars.com just bought Dealer Raider. And, you know, they're, they're looking for other avenues of, of profit, other avenues to added value what they sell you. But there are other companies that, like Car Gurus right now, is probably the predominant successful in that, in that genre. Car Gurus is, is, is generating cost per sale. They're, 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 they're strong, very strong. 
I think you and I talked about that a minute ago, didn't we? Yeah, car gurus. And you know, I, I, I'm not a, opposed to changing my mind. I, last time I was here, I was condemning car gurus. But they changed, I changed. Exactly. Well, they were forced to change. You know, Car Gurus is founded by Langley Steiner, and he's the same guy that founded TripAdvisor. You know, pretty successful in that, that, that venue. Now, what's interesting? Tesla. I don't believe Tesla is going to stay in the car business. I believe you're going to see Tesla, Elon Musk, sell the Tesla car, car business. He's going to sell it to Google. He's going to sell it to Apple. He might sell it to uh, who? Who else is experimenting with that? Microsoft? There's any number, Delphi? There's a number of people that are in the autonomous car business, but right now, Amazon.com has just gotten in our business. Okay, the 800-pound gorilla, the elephant in the room, has just made itself known. Well, I'm holding Amazon stock I bought in the 400s it was, that, that hit 780 this morning. Amazon's on its way. And now Amazon has just announced they're going to get into car, the car business. They're going to get in the lead provider. And Amazon.com is going to be phenomenal. Another company just came out that I think is going to have a phenomenal impact. They're going to be a lead provider, but they're building their uh, showroom in Walmarts. And they've got over like 1,000 Walmart locations already pegged for their, for their launch coming up in the next couple of weeks. It's already contracted, already done. So the, to answer your question, the lead provider business is going to change players. Remember Bob Dylan back in the 60s, times there are changing, and he said, the loser now will be later to win? Okay, that's, that's what's going to happen right here. Things are going to change. Remember back in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s when newspapers were so damn arrogant they thought they owned us? I mean, if any of, if any of you dealt with, with newspapers back in the 90s, when they owned the market, they were real hard people to deal with. Well, I think you're going to see a lot of the arrogance coming out of those companies because we don't need them anymore. Matter of fact, SEO, SEM, dealers can generate their own business. You know, we, I've got dealers that have dropped all third-party lead, lead vendors. And they invested the money in SEO, SEM themselves, they invested in social media. As I said earlier, Facebook is generating tremendous sales. Facebook's the real deal. You know, there's 3 billion uh, adults on Facebook, give or take 5 or 6. But there's 3 billion adults, and 38% of them are U.S. citizens. In 1928, I guess it was, they asked bank robber Willie Sutton why he robbed banks. And Willie Sutton said, because that's where the money is. Why do you want to be on Facebook? because that's where the consumers are. In the next couple of years, in the 90s of percentages, 90s of percentages, depending on whose survey you look at, of all content on the internet is going to be video. You've got to be involved in video, and I'm talking about generated video, and you've got to, got to get involved in, in video walkarounds, video and blogs on your website. So when I have a web provider today, I want some amount of control coming from the dealership where we can, we can blog and we can do certain things on the website. Content is what's killing it right now. I'm not a Google expert. I mean, I don't I tend to be analytical. We've had some analytical speakers today, but what's the first four letters of analytical? That's not, I'm a, I shoot from the hip and from the gut. But the truth of the matter is, 
these things are selling. It's working with real customers in the real world. And that's what I'm reacting to. My social media, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling down thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a month personally off of Facebook. Aren't I, Jeff? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm killing it on Facebook. My dealers are killing it on Facebook. Because that's where the people are. Will he rob banks because that's where the money is? I'm on Facebook because that's where the community is, and that's where the community spends an inordinate amount of time. They stay, on, they stay on, on Facebook for hours as opposed to other places on the Internet for minutes. You know, we're generating that, we're doing that. Um, questions? We're not done, are we? Anything about anything in the business? Thank you very much. <laughs>